Hello everyone. Um, I just want to start off by saying, I, if you can't hear me, please put a comment in. I just want to make sure before I get too far in that if anybody's watching that they let us know whether or not you can hear me. So I am Dr. Shannon Clark. I am a double board certified OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist. Uh, I'm a professor at an academic center in Texas uh, where I am, my patients are all pregnant with conditions that are either uh, maternal related or, and or fetal related. Um, so I do all high risk pregnancies is what I do. And I want to thank Belly Bandit for inviting me to take over their Instagram live today to do a discussion on back and pelvic pain and pregnancy because I'm sure that affects a lot of us and we'll go over that. Um, some questions were submitted beforehand, so I'm gonna answer those questions. I don't know how long I'll have to answer questions that come through now, but I think pretty much everything I'm doing uh, is going, or gonna talk about is gonna be covered. Um, so here we go. I'm just gonna start off by doing a, a quick intro uh, on back and pelvic pain and pregnancy. First of all, back and pelvic pain and pregnancy is extremely common. What it used to be called was syphysis pubic dysfunction or SPD, but now it's more commonly called pelvic girdle pain or PGP. Um, and it's very, very common, it's very uncomfortable, uh, and it can cause stiffness in your joints of your pelvis. And because of your pelvis, and I'll show you my little pelvis here, this is your pelvis. The more common thing that you hear about is the, uh, the um, uh, symphysis pubis here. Okay, you have the pubic tubercles and then the symphysis pubis here, and then on the back, and there's, that's a joint, so you can have a lot of pain. And this will be kind of down where, by where your bladder is or behind your pubic bone. And as you can see, this is the bladder right behind the pubic bone. And then back here, is the sacroiliac joint, the sacroiliac joint. So those two joints on either side, that's connected to your spine, your lower spine, which is connected to your lower back. So you'll have a lot of lower back pain, but really where most everything kind of originates, or we think that most of it is in the pelvis. Most everything originates in the pelvis and it kind of radiates into your lower back and other, and sometimes even up into your upper back. Um, so back pain in pregnancy affects about 50 to 80% of pregnant women. So that's a lot, I know it affected me for sure. Um, and it can be mild back pain all the way to acute onset pain. It can be chronic pain. It can be debilitating pain where it's even hard to walk. I've had a few patients over my career that uh, needed a walker to walk, who needed assistance because their pelvic girdle pain and back pain was so severe. Um, and it's, it's rare, but it does happen. Um, and then studies show that lower back pain usually occurs between the fifth and the seventh uh, month of pregnancy. So around 20 weeks to 28 weeks is usually when it's, the onset is. And that's because at about 20 weeks, you're really, the, the uterus is out of the pelvis, you're definitely feeling pregnant, and then it just, your belly gets bigger from there, so you might start to have more severe symptoms as you get head into that third trimester at, or at around 28 weeks. Um, some people will have it earlier, even in the first trimester. And typically, that's gonna be people who have been pregnant more than once. We found that people who have pelvic girdle pain, back pain, it tends to get worse and earlier in onset which with each subsequent pregnancy, especially if nothing was done in between pregnancies to address that pelvic girdle pain or back pain. What people don't really realize is that pregnancy is a huge stress and strain on your body. If you enter the pregnancy not in the best physical shape, or if you don't try to get your core muscles, your back muscles, and all of that in shape in between pregnancies, you're more likely to continue to experience not only pelvic pain and, and, and back pain, but you could experience more even diffuse pain up and through your spine and into your hips and even down into your knees. So that's how everything's kind of interconnected. The pelvic, pelvic area, pelvic bones, um, all the tendons, ligaments in the pelvis are related to the lower back. That's all related into your hips. Um, and that's related into your belly and to your core muscles. So having strong core muscles is also essential. So all of that's interrelated. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. Um, about 10% of the time we found that, and I mentioned this, it can be so severe that it interferes with your day-to-day -day living or even your ability to work. And that's about in about 10% of pregnant persons. Um, women or persons with pre-existing lower back pain, pelvic pain, people who have had surgery on their pelvis before, surgery on their lower back, any kind of musculoskeletal type surgery in the pelvic area or the lower back area, are at increased risk for having earlier onset and more severe pelvic pain and back pain with pregnancy for obvious reasons. You're growing another human. The, the, the hormones in your pregnancy cause all the tendons and ligaments that connect the bones to kind of relax because your pelvis needs to relax a little bit for when it's time to carry that baby and then also deliver the baby. So that's just nature's way of making more room to help those pelvic bones relax. So if you've had an injury before or you're already predisposed to pelvic and or back pain, you're more likely to have pain and um, 
earlier onset or um, more severe in your pregnancies. So let's talk about what the symptoms might be. For, let's talk about pelvic, pelvic girdle pain or PGP. You might feel that over the pubic bone at the very front center, like right here, um, right at the level of your hips, you might have pain there. Um, you might have across one or both sides of your lower back up in here, right, up, right at, above where your hip bones might, or your, your bones might be in the back of, of your hips. Um, you can have pain between your vagina and anus, which is the perineum. So if you're looking at the vaginal, op oh, vaginal opening here and your anus, this area here is called the perineum and you might have pain there. Um, you might have it even spreading down into your thighs. And then you can also feel, and I felt this when I was pregnant, you can feel uh, or, or hear a clicking or grinding in the pelvic area. When you're sitting down, standing up, when you're moving or make a sudden, sudden movement, you might feel a clicking or a grinding. It, it, that doesn't really hurt, it's just weird. And you know that it's not normal to feel that and you know that something's going on. Um, the pain typically gets worse if you're walking, if you're going up and down steps, if you're standing on one leg for whatever reason, for example, if you're putting on a shoe or you're getting dressed and you're standing on one leg, you might find that that exacerbates the pain. If you're <coughs> turning over from side to side in bed, or if you're spreading your, like your knees apart, for example, when you go to get out of a car and you take that leg to stick it out of a car and your knees are coming apart, you might feel it then because what that's doing is it's causing your hips to open, which causes, it's just causing extra stress on your pelvic uh, area and your pelvic muscles and the bones, and that might exacerbate, exacerbate the pain. Lower back pain or lower uh, lumbar pain is located at above, above the waist and the center of the back. And it can also be associated with something called sciatica. And I'm sure that most people have heard about sciatica. Sciatica is a big nerve that comes out of the lower bar, part of your back and it goes down your butt and it goes down into your, your legs and, and, and down by your knees. You might feel a sharp pain. And what I've seen a lot of people do, they will, if they're pushing a grocery cart, they're kind of leaning over because that takes <coughs> some pressure off the lower back and helps that sciatic nerve pain. So if you're finding you're needing to lean over to relieve that sharp pain, that might be an indication that you have sciatica. Okay, <coughs> posterior pelvic pain, which is actually, actually in the back of the pelvis, is four times more prevalent than lumbar pain or lower back pain in pregnancy. It's a, it's a deep pain felt below the waistline on one or both sides and across the tailbone. So if you, I don't know if you could tell on me, if you're looking at me, so my tailbone's way down here. So it's gonna kind of be like this rather than lower back. Does that make sense? So kind of a little bit lower across where you, like where your butt crack might start is where it's gonna be, okay? So that's kind of an indication of posterior pelvic pain. Okay, why does this happen? Why is pelvic girdle pain, lower back pain so common in pregnancy? Okay, you have hormones. Hormones are great because we need them for pregnancy, but they can also cause a lot of discomfort for us. And that's one reason why in the pelvic pain and the lower back pain. They cause the ligaments to relax, like I said, to soften and the joints to loosen in preparation for giving birth. That's just nature's way of allowing us to carry the baby and having a baby. <coughs> and it's also going to cause a little bit of un instability in some people more than others. Not everybody experiences it, but like I said, up to 80% of people can experience it. You're also gonna have a shift, have a shift in, your in your center of gravity. Your belly gets bigger. You're shifting how you're carrying how yourself, how you're walking. You're gonna have a change in your center of gravity. And that's just, that's gonna happen with everybody, okay? You, you can't help but for, for it to happen. Additional weight, adding additional weight with pregnancy, whether it's above what's recommended or if you have a quick, rapid weight gain, excuse me, that, I drank coffee before I got here, sorry. So uh, before you, rapid additional weight gain or fast weight gain, that can cause um, more stress in the pelvic area and your lower back area and cause the pain to be more intense. If you have poor posture or you're carrying yourself in a not so ideal way, that can add, um, uh, some stress too, for example, like I said, poor posture, excessive standing and bending over can trigger or escalate back pain. And then stress. Stress, for whatever reason, accumulates in the weaker areas of our body. So stress can affect how you carry yourself. And if your core is not the strongest area of your body, I know mine's not, then you have a weak core that can also, the stress can cause that to lead into lower back pain and pelvic girdle pain. So stress is, is a, is a plays a role as well. So one of the questions that I got was, <coughs> what types of products, therapies, lifestyle changes can help with back pain? Now, I'm not gonna go through all this. There's a lot here, a 
a lot here, and I want to save some room for questions if I can get to them. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make this into a blog, and I'll share it with Belly Bandit so you guys can have the resources that I've used, and you guys can read this, but I'll go through some of them. The key is to get diagnosed as early as possible to prevent long-term discomfort over the course of your pregnancy or for, for, for the, to keep the pain from getting too bad. Now, I'm going to say this, and I love my profession, but there is kind of a culture of, you're pregnant, what are you going to do about it? It'll get better when you have the baby. And to some degree, that's true. But if someone's in severe pain to where they can't sleep, they can't do normal day-to-day -day activities, they can't take care of their children at home because of the pelvic pain or the pressure or the lower back pain or the hip pain or the sciatica type pain, that's not normal, okay? And if it's interfering with what you're able to do, if you're not able to get out of bed without getting help, if you're not able to go up and down stairs without getting help, if you, it's impossible to get out of a car, then it's more than just what's expected with pregnancy. We need to do a better job as obstetricians of recognizing that instead of just dismissing it because I know that a lot of us do. So one thing that you can do is advocate for yourself and you can say, look doc, I know I'm pregnant. I know there's gonna be a certain level of discomfort. Pregnancy is not always comfortable, but I can't function or I can't do this or I can't do that. I'm having to miss work. I, I'm not getting any sleep because I can't get in a comfortable position. One thing, and I, those of you that know me on Babies After 35 that I'm a huge advocate for is pelvic floor physical therapist. They know the pelvic floor, they know the pelvic area, and they know how to help people who are pregnant to deal with the aches and pains of pregnancy, especially if it's getting to the point where it's really interfering with your day-to-day -day life. So you can get do your own referral. A lot of times you don't need your doctor to get that referral. But if you do, you need to ask your doctor, hey, I want to be seen by someone, a physical therapist or a pelvic floor physical therapist to help me with this. They can really help you. So that's my two cents on that. So let's start by that. Getting an early diagnosis, getting an early referral to physical therapy who specializes in obstetric pelvic joint problems, like a pelvic floor PT. They can help teach you stretches, exercises, and I'll go through some of those, but you know, I can't, I don't have time for all that here, but I'll give you guys some resources. Um, they can pinpoint where the pain's originating from. They can tell you some ways to help carry yourself differently or exercises, stretches that you could do to help alleviate that pain. They're, they're so, so re resourceful. Um, one of the things they can do is manual therapy to make sure your, the joints of your pelvis, hip and spine move normally. They can also show you exercises to strengthen your pelvic floor, stomach, back and hip muscles. They could give you some exercises to do in water, which is always a good thing in pregnancy. Um, they can also give you some exercises and some suggestions on how to get through labor. Because one thing we do find in, in, is that people who have had really severe pelvic and back pain in pregnancy, when it comes time to labor, it's not always comfortable for them. So getting that uh, addressed sooner than later so that we can have coping mechanisms or we can have some exercises to help get you through labor better is ideal. They can also do pain relief such as the TENS unit, which someone had asked that on a, on a question beforehand. Yes, they can do that. The physical therapist can do that. Um, and they can also give you other, if, if the pain's pretty severe, they can give you uh, uh, some crutches. They can also give you pelvic support belts. And I know the Belly Bandit has on their website some um, belly, uh, some uh, support, pregnancy support belts. And I'm a huge advocate of a pregnancy support belt, okay? I really am. It helps when you're being active. What I don't think is that you should rely on a pelvic support belt because if you rely on it too much, it will make other areas of your body weaker. You still have to have time out of the pelvic support belt. For example, when I was working and I was pregnant with twins, I was a surgeon, okay? I would wear the pelvic support belt. As soon as I got in the car or as soon as I got home, I took it off while I was doing my normal day-to-day -day activities at home and I didn't rely on it 100%. You still need to have time out of it, but it is a good resource for you and a good product for you to get to help with the lower back pain and the pelvic pain. Um, okay, daily activities. Okay, there's a gazillion things you can do. I'm gonna pick some of the ones I have on the list of about 20 here. Let's talk about a few of them. Um, let's see. Avoid twisting, bending movements like vacuum or pushing heavy supermarket market trolleys. So if it gets to the point where you're really being compromised because of the pelvic and or lower back pain, until you are getting some therapy and some way to to help strengthen your muscles and help with stretches, don't do anything that's going to hurt you. I'm not saying you can't vacuum the rest of your pregnancy. And if you're not getting help, you may not be able to. But until you're able to learn how to do those things, which a physical therapist can help you do and, and teach you how to modify how you're carrying yourself so you could do those activities, just hold off on that. 
Uh, you need to walk, stand, and stretch for at least at least once an hour. So for those of us who are work at a desk, working behind a computer, who are sitting for long periods of time, when you're pregnant, that is not a good idea for multiple reasons. I won't go into all that, but it's never a good idea for any pregnant person to be sitting in one position for a prolonged period of time. You still get, need to get up hourly and do some stretches and move around. Um, what else? Avoid lifting heavy weights, loads. If you're going to do it, you need to do it sl slowly and make sure you kind of widen your gait and do it at a nice, slow, controlled pace. Um, you could sit down to get dressed and undressed. And the reason for that is you, if you're standing up, you're going to tend to go on one leg more than the other or raise up that one leg, which can exacerbate your pain. Uh, let's see. Wear, wear comfortable, supportive shoes with a good sole. That's so important. It really is. And I can't stress that enough. I had to change the shoes I was wearing on labor and delivery because I was pregnant. I usually wear lower clogs and dance goes, but that just wasn't cutting it for me. So I had to change while I was pregnant. Um, what else about the shoes? Extremely high heels are out. As are, and I, I, get, I got mixed messages on this. They said, obviously, no extremely high heels. Some sources say, say to avoid completely flat shoes. And then... Some say you need to have um, at least two inch heel to help your body in alignment. What I think, I don't think anything completely flat is going to help. You might need a little bit of a lift there depending on who you are. You might need to go try out some different shoes to see what feels better for you. Um, so I don't think anything high or anything completely flat is ideal, especially if you're on your feet working. You might need to try some different types of shoes to see with a little bit of a heel to, to help you kind of keep your balance, okay? And that might take some trial and error there. Let's see, we talked about avoiding prolonged standing, sitting or standing. Um, go hot and cold. Soothe sore muscles by applying cold compresses, then warm comp compresses in 15 minute intervals. <coughs> so I was uh, brought up of the thought that if you have a muscle strain, a muscle um, spasm, you apply heat right away. Until my good friend who's a chiropractor said, actually, the more you warm it up, it recruits blood to go there, which might cause it to throb more and actually hurt more. So start with cold first to kind of cool it down, chill it out, then do some warm. And you don't want to do too cold or too hot, either, either extreme. You want to do middle of the road, okay? But alternating it is key. Uh, sleeping in a comfort comfortable position. A lot of times people find that putting a pillow in between their legs helps. Those body pillows, you know, you can kind of contort them into ways that, you, that are more comfortable for you. Um, massage. Massage is ideal. And now I've heard different things about the cutouts on the massage table. I know ACOG says you can do that. However, when I posted a video about that, every massage therapist says, no, we don't like the cutouts. And they gave me a gazillion reasons why. And I trust them because that's what they do. It's their profession. So... I'm going to go with massage therapist. I'm going to say if massage therapist says don't use the table with the hole cut out for your belly, then don't use it. But let them know you're pregnant. You want to let them know you're pregnant so that they can, and you want to go to massage ther therapist who knows how to do massage therapy on a pregnant person and is comfortable doing it. Um, I've heard several times where they went to get a massage, the therapist they were assigned to said, I am not touching you, you're pregnant. I'm not trained to do that. Or I'm not comfortable with that. So make sure when you go to sign up for a massage that you tell them I'm pregnant, I'm this far along, different massage places will have different rules about how far along you need to be. A lot of them won't do it in the first trimester and won't want to wait to the second trimester. So just make sure you check that out first. Okay. Exercises. Regular low impact exercising using light to moderate effort is recommended for pregnancy. And that's in general. What I generally tell people is whatever exercise level your body was accustomed to when you got pregnant is what you can maintain for a majority of your pregnancy. I have a, a friend who's actually, you know, very competitive uh, athlete and uh, is very in really, really good shape. And she's maintained most of what she was doing. But then your body kind of changes, your, your uh, stamina changes, and you might need to change your exercises based on the size of your belly. And that's fine too. But you don't want to start doing something crazy when you get pregnant that you've never done before. Your body's not going to have it. Okay, so that's an important thing to remember. So whatever your body was accustomed to is good. Now, if you entered pregnancy not with any kind of physical activity, which some of us do, you might want to consider walking 30 minutes a day, some light resistance training, but nothing crazy. You don't want to start doing an exercise that's going to hurt you because you're not used to it. But I'm not going to say if you've never had exercise or didn't have a regimen that you can't do anything in pregnancy. No, you can still walk. 
you, you can do some light resistance training, but that's pretty much all I'm going to recommend for somebody whose body is not conditioned to anything more extensive. Some walking, but regular routine walking is ideal. And there's also a lot of other types of, and let me back up, the exercise thing. It's, it's, our into, it's our nature to think, well, I'm hurting. My back and my pelvis are hurting. I'm not going to do any exercise. It's going to make it worse. Well, it could be that you not doing exercise, that you not doing any exercise is what's making it worse. Okay. Or stretching. What you need to do is see the physical therapist so that they can assess you and let you know what you need to do. Just don't, don't assume because you're in pain that you shouldn't do any physical activity because that not, may not be the wrong approach. Getting that second opinion from a physical therapist and people who do this every day is very, very important because I'm going to be honest and I love my field. We're not trained in that. So if you're going to ask me those questions, I'm going to say, see a physical therapist because I know what my limitations are. Okay. And I'm definitely not going to say because I don't know you shouldn't do anything. That's not fair either. I'm not going to tell you not to do it because I don't understand it. So if that's what your doctor's telling you, then you might want to say, eh, we need to discuss this. Send me to somebody that can give me a recommendation that, because that's their expertise. Okay. All right. So let's see some good exercises, antenatal yoga, some Pilates for pregnant persons, which they have that swimming exercise is good. Physiotherapy, yoga. I talked about that. Uh, walking, biking, swimming. Now the biking thing for a certain period of time is okay. <clears throat> you don't want to get to a point unless it's something you're used to and it's been a part of your lifestyle biking and then you fall and hit your belly. So that's always something to consider. If you're not used to it, don't pick it up when you're pregnant. Meaning don't pick up the, the hobby of biking if you're, you weren't used to it before you got pregnant. Um, let's see. Avoid high impact exercise, running, tennis, or anything that can evolve that you could potentially have trauma. Strengthen your core. Pelvic tilts, and I have um, two resources that I researched, that I, two sites that I found had really good stretches and exercises, and that I, I can't go through that here because I can't show you, but I'm going to send the links to Belly Bandit so they can share, you, share with you. I cannot stress enough that if you are planning a pregnancy, strengthen your core muscles. A good core going into pregnancy is so helpful, guys. If your core is weak, you are going to have low back pain in pregnancy. I can guarantee you. Okay. Now, if you're pregnant, already pregnant, and you have a weak core, there's not a whole lot you can do, especially if you're further along in pregnancy, but there are some exercises you can do to kind of mitigate what's going on or help a little bit, but you're not going to get rock hard abs while you're pregnant. So if you have the time to do it before you get pregnant, that's the ideal time to do it. So again, the physical therapist can let you know which exercises you can do while you're pregnant or start to do while you're pregnant that can help with your core. Um, okay. General rule of thumb, if it hurts, don't do it. If it's making your pain worse, don't do it. Talk to somebody and see if we can alter what, what kind of exercise you're doing. Okay, what things that you should avoid? Standing on one leg, bending and twisting to lift, carrying a baby on one hip. I got, <laughs> I had twins and one of my twins was really big and, one, and my boy was really big and my girl was really small and he jacked up my whole, all of this. I didn't even realize it because I was always carrying him like this and I already had back, back issues because I was on bed rest for two months and I didn't have time to do anything because I went back to work and I had twins at home and I'm still paying for it and it's been four years. So all of that's interconnected. How we carry ourselves, how we carry our babies, all of that's interconnected. Um, avoid crossing your legs, sitting on the floor or getting or sitting side, or sitting twisted like this. If you're sitting on the floor and you're pregnant and you have pelvic and back pain, getting up is not going to be easy or fun. Okay. Avoid sitting or standing for long periods of time. Um, let's see, pushing heavy objects like in the grocery store, uh, and carrying anything one handed. The other thing that I always say when I get a chance, watch the backpacks, the purses, the diaper bags. We have a tendency to put our whole entire life in there. And the next thing you know, it's 15 pounds. That's not going to help you. So just minimize what you're carrying and have your necessities in there and don't let it get too big because carrying about, you know, a backpack or a shoulder bag or anything that's really uh, over, you know, heavy when you're pregnant is not ideal. Okay. Now I will send these, uh, um, exercises again to belly bandit or I'll put them in a blog or something and we'll share eventually soon. The next question is what stretches or exercises can alleviate back pain. Now the first, and I researched all this and these are just random websites. I went through a lot of very, very notable ones. And then I went through some not so notable ones. And I actually found two that had excellent examples of stretches and exercises you can do in pregnancy, um, with, pictures and even videos. The first one is going to be on it's orthocarolina.com 
And if you go to orthocarolina.com or you Google safe exercises to combat low back pain and pelvic pain during pregnancy, and the website is orthocarolina.com, this is excellent. I love it. I love it. I actually didn't see it until I was researching for this talk. And I'm telling you, this is so good. They teach you how to do the pelvic tilt, sitting, seated, standing. They teach you how to do the, the quadruped cat, the bird dog, all these things you can do in pregnancy, the resisted sidestep, resisted kickback, and they give you how to do it, how many rep, rep, reps to do, and, and they give you pictures of how to do it. This resource is excellent. Now, the next resource is abilityrehabilitation.com. And the title is Eight Great Pelvic Floor Stretches to Do During Pregnancy. Again, on abilityrehabilitation.com. This is excellent as well. This gives you videos on how to do things in a chair at home and even and on the floor. So this is really, 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 really good. And I, and I love this. And this is actually be good for people that aren't pregnant, actually. Both of these resources would. So those are my two, two top picks for uh, things that I found online. And again, I, I looked for a couple of hours to try to find something like this. And I don't even know these, these businesses. I have no affiliation with them whatsoever, but I like their, 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 their blog and what they put out. Okay. Next question. Are subsequent pregnancies typically more uncomfortable than the last? Is there any correlation? The answer is yes. I already answered that. You have more babies passing through your pelvis, more times that your pelvis has relaxed because of the hormones, more times you've passed babies through that pelvis. Of course, you're going to have more pain, especially if you're not rehabbing yourself in between pregnancies. Re Actually, I'm going to coin that. Re go through post-baby rehab, meaning rehab your body. Because even if you're really, really in shape, you're still going to have some catch-up to do. Or if you weren't, you're going to have to really rehab your body in preparation for the next pregnancy. That's very, very, very important. That, again, that's where a physical therapist can also fit in. Um, so because of the, you know, the different pregnancies and the hormones and rela relaxation of the ligaments and the pelvic bones and the lower back, yes, that's going to cause it to occur and could be worse in subsequent pregnancies and occur earlier. And bigger babies. The more babies we have... The trend is each subsequent baby gets a little bigger, okay? So bigger the baby, passing through the, the vaginal canal and through the pelvic floor, the pelvic floor muscles, the more chance that you're going to have trauma or, you know, just carrying that weight around for all that time with, with subsequent pregnancies is going to cause more pelvic girdle pain and lower back pain. Okay, does posture affect pain? Yes, and I mentioned that at the top of this talk. Yes, good posture is essential, and you can still have good posture and be pregnant. It's not easy, and we have to... Uh, be mindful of it and not forget because a lot of our we're doing this or we're kind of sitting back or we're kind of doing that and we think that's helping the, our goal is to, actually our goal is to kind of make room for the belly but what we're not realizing is we're jacking up our backs and our pelvis and our hips by what we're doing so some things you can do is you sit on a firm chair with a rolled towel or cushion to support the lower back in the back at home at work Make sure the chairs you use provide good support, preferably with a straight back, arms, and a firm cushion. Now, that's not necessarily comfortable, but if you want to minimize your pelvic girdle pain and your lower back pain, then that's what you need to do while you're pregnant. Use a footrest to elevate your feet slightly. Don't cross your legs. I think we, the common theme here is don't cross your legs in pregnancy. Um, directly face your computer screen. Avoid sitting with a side posture. Place a pillow between your knees and ankles when lying on your side at night in bed. Roll into your side before getting out of bed, keeping your legs together. So take the pillow out between your legs, roll over to your side, keep your knees together, and then get up. Um, keep your legs together when turning over in bed and when getting in and out of the car is important. Keep your back straight when moving from sitting to standing and using your arms to push up. So those are all some things that you can do to help improve your posture. Okay. Is it normal to experience sharp pain in the lower side, like the pelvic area or also a bit further up into the lower stomach? Now we're going to talk about round ligament pain. Okay, actually, there's another question. Okay, that's from round ligament pain. I'm sure all of you guys know what round ligament pain is because I will venture to say 90%, maybe not that many, a lot of people make at least one emergency room trip or OB labor delivery trip because of what they thought was something bad because you're having so much pain and you think I'm miscarrying or I'm in preterm labor and it's around ligament pain, okay? So I'm gonna go into more detail a few questions down. 
Another person submitted the question, does supplementing with magnesium help pregnancy discomfort? I researched this. For the us evidence-based physicians, academic physicians, we do what's called PubMed and Ovid researchers re, uh, searches. Those are the two main uh, sites we use to research scientific literature. The most recent study I had or saw was from 2017, where they gave oral magnesium for leg cramps treatment in pregnancy uh, to let's see, 132 pregnant women. They all had leg cramps, so the primary outcome was the frequency of leg cramp episodes per week reported by pregnant persons. The secondary outcome was the occurrence of leg cramps and oral magnesium side effects. Basically what they found is oral magnesium supplementation during pregnancy did not reduce the occurrence and frequency of episodes of leg cramps and it caused more GI distress, diarrhea, and side effects. Most prenatal vitamins, maybe all, but most prenatal vitamins are gonna have some magnesium in them. Um, if you're finding that you're having extra muscle cramps and before you start taking a bunch of magnesium, maybe get your magnesium level checked to see um, we can do that with a blood test, um, but just be careful because if you take a bunch of magnesium, it might actually cause um, diarrhea and nausea, which can lead to dehydration, which can cause uterine cramping. So, uh, yes, I know magnesium is natural and you can get it at the herbal store and everybody's all about natural this and natural that. Just those of you who know me know how I feel about the word natural. Just because it's, you know, at a, a, a GNC doesn't mean it's okay to take. You need to always let your physician know, your health care provider, your obstetrical care provider know what natural things you're taking. They need to know what you're taking. So just be careful with the magnesium. Um, the studies really don't support that. Okay. I'm 22 weeks and I have really bad varicose vein on my right leg. What can help with this? Varicose veins. Um, I'm not going to, I'm going to assume most people know what varicose veins are. Basically what, what that come, where that comes from is because of the hormones in pregnancy, your vessels dilate. That's why sometimes they get leaky and you can get some swelling. That's where the veins and, your, and, and the dependent areas where the veins are, your legs, your lower legs, um, sometimes even up to your knees, sometimes even up to your thighs, and in the labia, the vulva, you can even get varicose veins. That's because they're dependent areas and that's where blood can pull, okay? What we typically see is that the varicose veins typically get worse with subsequent pregnancies because you've had more of the episodes of the dilation of the veins and, and, and the potential for earlier onset, onset varicose veins as well. What you can do for varicose veins is elevation, compression socks. Compression socks can go up to, I oh, can't, can't show me, up right above below your knee. You wanna get sure, make sure you get the right size. You don't want them to be too tight, okay? You don't want them to make a, like a, a crease in your leg or your, below your knee. So you might want to try different sizes because they don't, you don't want them too tight and you don't wear them 24 seven. You wear them when you're up and moving around, when you're home and you're relaxing, just elevate your feet. Okay, question, I have scoliosis in my upper back. Will pregnancy make this worse? Yes, it can. Like I said, anybody with pre-existing spine issues, pelvic issues, whether it's from trauma, surgery, scoliosis, whatever, pregnancy will likely can cause issues because again for all the reasons that I stated that pregnancy causes the the stress on a, on a person's body it's gonna be especially uh, applicable to someone who has those pre-existing conditions so yeah now we're gonna talk about lightning crotch and round ligament pain and this is so cool I, we're gonna learn a little about embryology here okay did you know that round ligament pain and lightning crotch are actually connected I'm gonna explain how in a fetus the gubernaculum that is a word, gubernaculum, but it's G-U-B-E-R, not G-O-O-B-E-R. Gubernaculum is an undifferentiated mesenchymal tissue attached to the ovari ovarian tissue in the female fetus and testicular tissue in a male fetus. Excuse me. <coughs> Let me see if I can find. Do I have a uterus here somewhere? Okay. Here's kind of a uterus. Ovary. So... It is an undifferent, this is while the fetus is developing, okay, during embryology. So the gubernoculum is an undifferentiated mesenchymal tissue attached to the ovarian tissue in a female fetus and the testicular tissue in a male fetus. If you don't know, during embryology, the testes are uh, developed and form inside and then drop down um, as the uh, male fetus develops over time. <clears throat> during the early stages of urogenital development in the female fetus, the gubernoculum develops a connective tissue band. That band, a connective tissue, it's a ligament to span is what it's called, is attached to the ovary on one side and the labia minora, majora on the other side. 
So that means it kind of travels down and it goes all the way down and it kind of attaches to the labia minora. During its course from the ovary, it runs to the corner or the, the kind of corner of the uterus right here and adheres to the uterus. Then it continues upward into the labia majora. So basically if this is the front of your, this is the front of your abdomen, this is inside your abdomen. It's going to start here, then it attaches to the cornea of the uterus or the corner, then it kind of travels down and it attaches to your anterior abdominal wall and courses through into your labia majora. Okay. When you're seeing a uterus and you're not pregnant, there's no tension on that round ligament. But as you get pregnant and it gets bigger and bigger, that, that cord, round ligament starts stretching and stretching and stretching and stretching. So that's where you get round ligament pain. In adults, the gubernaculum develops into the round ligament of the uterus. And going back to the male fetus, what happens? The gubernaculum pulls the testes through the abdomen through the inguinal canal, which is the inguinal canal is down, I don't know if you can see, is down here. We have an inguinal, inguinal canal here, but it pulls the testes from inside through the inguinal canal and then they drop outside. That's when you hear about the testes dropping and sometimes male fetuses don't have, or they have an undescended testicle because it's still inside. It needs to come through that inguinal, inguinal canal. So for in male fetuses, the gubernoculum pulls the testes through the abdomen, through the inguinal canal, into the groin and down into the scrotum. The pulling action occurs as the gubernoculum is stimulated to first grow and then to shrink. Okay, so now, why does that matter? Well, round ligament pain, what you're going to feel, is a brief sharp pain in the lower belly and pelvis, usually on the either side of the groin, right here, okay? And it's one of the most common complaints during pregnancy. However, the discomfort is considered a normal part of pregnancy as your body stretches and grows and happens most often during the second trimester. <clears throat> right around 13 weeks or so, the uterus is definitely out of the pelvis, and that's when you really start getting tension on that round ligament, okay? What people will, will think is that they'll feel really sharp, almost lightning pain here, and it's usually on one side worse than the other. It's very rarely to have round ligament pain on both sides. It can happen, but it's more common to have it on one side or the other. You might feel it when you go to stand up, when you make a movement, and you'll feel like, Ugh, and it's like, something's going on and it can be pretty painful. It can even bring you to your knees or tears to your eyes. It can be very painful. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm take a drink of water. Um, it's more, you know, we have more patients coming in complaining of that pain in the second trimester, okay? Because then the uterus is definitely out of the pelvis. It's putting more pressure on the round ligament and it can really hurt. Um, whereas, is it, is the, we already talked about the cause of the now, the lightning crotch, where that comes into, is if it's not just round ligament pain and it goes, up, goes ahead and courses down into your, your vulva, you might feel that sharp pain in your vulva, down, you know, in your vaginal area. And that really, really hurts. That happens for the same reasons that round ligament pain happens. And it can also happen due to the, due to the actual pressure of the baby's head on your cervix. And also the baby put, putting pressure on the nerve endings around your pelvis. Think about, you know, this, you have a baby in here, this pelvis is full of blood vessels. It's full of nerves. And as the baby gets down lower and gets bigger, it can put pressure on all those nerves. So not only are you having the round ligament pain, which can translate into lightning crotch pain, then you have the actual nerve pain that can cause lightning crotch and lightning crotch is no joke. There's some people that have it earlier in their pregnancy. There's some people who have it their entire pregnancy. There's some people who even have it when they're not pregnant for whatever reason. There are some non-obstetrical reasons for lightning crotch, but in, in pregnancy, those are the reasons why, because of the round ligament pain that translates into lightning crotch and because the baby being in the pelvis causing a pressure on those nerves. Here's what you can do. You could try over-the-counter pain relief. You could talk to your doctor about which, which over-the-counter pain relief is gonna be best. 9.9 .9 times out of 10, they're gonna tell you Tylenol. Tylenol does work, actually, more so than people give it credit for, and sometimes it doesn't work. Exercise. Plenty to keep your core muscles strong. I can't really express enough upon you about core muscles. If I had to give you one piece of information or advice, get your core strengthening, strengthened before you get pregnant. Okay, gentle uh, stretching, gentle exercises, or prenatal yoga can help to dec decrease the pain. Um, avoid sudden movements. Adjust your position slowly. Go slowly when you stand up or sit down. Apply warmth to that area. A warm bath or heating pad may help. Now, there's this whole thing about heating pads on your belly. Um, I'm not a big fan of it, it directly on the belly.
because a lot of times we might let it get too hot and we're just not really paying attention to it or it might feel good and next thing you know it's really really hot or you fall asleep and you're on a heating pad for hours that's not what we want so I think it's just better to use maybe warm compresses for a short period of time on that specific area rather than your whole entire abdomen uh, then you can also wear a maternity support belt or like from belly band at one of the belly bands rest on one side with the knees bent and pillows between the legs under the belly okay that's also what you can do that is for round ligament pain lightning crotch finally I'm gonna close with this and then I'll answer some questions sometimes back pain is a red flag that sounds that something else is going on um, the one thing is you can be in preterm labor okay um, and you need to watch for that pain that's constant is typically not gonna be preterm labor if it's preterm labor it's gonna come and go with the uterine contractions um, so if you're having that that might be a sign that it's not really just back pain of pregnancy or pelvic girdle pain of pregnancy that something else is going on um, if you're feeling your uterus ball up and then relax and ball up and then relax that's your uterus contracting that's not necessarily pain from pelvic girdle pain or back pain if you have that with vaginal bleeding or any other kind of discharge that's you know abnormal or not typical for you you need to let your doctor or your obstetrical care provider know if you experience numbness, tingling, or a sharp shooting pain in your buttocks, legs, or feet, you need to call your doctor to let them know that's, that's going on so you can be evaluated. Um, what else? I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just important in general to not assume that what you're experiencing is normal. And uh, talk, talk about it with your physician. And if you feel like your physician is dismissing you, you've got, you've got to either say, look, we have to talk this out because I'm not getting the answers that I, 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 I'm, I don't feel comfortable with what, what I'm being told we need to talk this out or send me somewhere else because you deserve that and most of the time it is just pregnancy, public girdle pain or something related to that uh, or the lower back pain but it, sometimes it can be something worse and we can't always assume that it's related to normal things of pregnancy okay so you have to make sure you're being heard and that you get answers and I, I mean I, I the reason why I say that is uh, I can remember I was a new I was in oh, residency, I don't remember. There was a pregnant patient who could not even walk, y'all. She couldn't, I felt so bad for her. But I also thought, well, is she making that up? I mean, and I no, give myself a break. I was new in my career and I'd never seen it like that. I, I didn't know, but she had such bad symphysis pubic dysfunction and pelvic girdle pain that she could not even walk. And she was in constant pain. And this lasted for a few months until she delivered. And ever since then and I felt so bad because I guess it was I was learning and I don't beat myself up too much but I, I will never dismiss that again because it is a legitimate thing it's a legitimate cause of some severe pain in pregnancy and we have to over we have to evaluate it and see exactly what's going on and there are things we can do we can't just dismiss it and say oh it's it'll go away once she delivers or they deliver we have physical therapists, we have occupational therapists, we have things that, uh, resources that we can use that, that can help the patient uh, learn some new exercises and stretching techniques to get them through uh, until they deliver. Okay, that's all I have. Let me see what questions I have. I don't know if I have very many. So I had pelvic pain in pregnancy and now five months postpartum I have knee pain. So that, like a said before pelvic pain lower back pain that's chronic and goes untreated will translate into pain in other areas of your body because your your natural instinct is to compensate for that pain with putting more pressure or altering how you're moving with other areas of your body which for you could have been your knees so you might have changed the way you walk and now you might have an issue with your knee but it all relates back to what was going on in your pregnancy okay I'm 25 weeks along and the pain I felt is on my left side, which is the only side I use to sleep. Pain goes from hip to lower back to the bra line. Um, I mean, it could be because of the way you're sleeping. I, I mean, I can't say. I, I'm not your doctor. I, I'm just reading what you're saying. But, you know, get evaluated. If it's something that's really inter interfering, you know, ask your doc to see a physical therapist or a public floor physical therapist and someone who specializes in pregnancy to see if they can give you some recommendations. Okay. Oops. 
Someone agreed with me that flat shoes are the worst. Okay. Oop. Where am I from? I live in Texas. I'm from Kentucky, but I live in Texas. Acupuncture once a week. What are your thoughts? My thoughts on acupuncture. I have a love-hate relationship with acupuncture, actually. I don't think it's going to hurt. I don't. I actually did acupuncture on my last attempt to get pregnant with the twins because I went through, uh, those of you who don't know, I told my story extensively on Babies After 35 about my journey to, to have my twins. I delivered them at nine days shy of my 43rd birthday. Um, acupuncture is not going to hurt, but that should not be your primary treatment or you, you need to be evaluated first to make sure nothing else is going on. I'm never going to tell anybody, don't do acupuncture. I think for me, it was beneficial and that it helped my stress level. Do I believe that it helps a lot of organic disease? I don't know. I'm still on the fence, but it's not going to hurt. It's acupuncture and it's worth a try, but don't defer a diagnosis to go to acupuncturist first to get treatment. Get a diagnosis and then see, based on what the diagnosis is, if treat the acupuncture might help. Now, a diagnosis does not mean it can only come from a doctor. Chiropractors can give you a diagnosis. Physical therapists can give you a diagnosis. And your doctor can give you a diagnosis. Sometimes it's a team effort, guys. Sometimes it's a team effort. I'm never going to say the diagnosis should only come from me because I'm an MD. No. I, I didn't study everything in medicine to be an obstetrician. There are things I didn't get to study. Now, I can read up on it and give you an educated guess based on my medical knowledge, but that's not my area of expertise. So I don't have a problem with saying, you know what? This is what I think it is. It's not, you don't have a urinary tract infection. You don't have pyelo or a kidney infection, which is the other thing that causes back pain that you don't want to overlook. When you're pregnant, you don't want to assume that it's not something and just go ahead straight to acupuncture without being evaluated by a medical professional to make sure that's nothing related to the pregnancy is what I'm trying to say. And then we can, can approach it with a team effort. Cupping, woo, sorry, cupping. Um, I'm not that familiar with cupping. And I don't know uh, anything about it in pregnancy. I don't. Um, so I don't know. I would encourage you to do your research. And if you're going, and if you're going to somebody that's doing acupuncture and cupping, make sure they know how to do it in pregnant patients, because not everything that applies to a non-pregnant patient can apply to a pregnant patient. So make sure they have knowledge on that and vet, just like you would vet your doctor, vet your your chiropractor or your acupuncturist or your cupper, whoever's doing your cupping, vet who's doing your physical therapy. Ask for, refer, ask for a recommendation or, you know, uh, reviews. Uh, ask around. There's nothing wrong with that. You can vet whoever's putting their hands on you to treat you. You should vet. That's my opinion. Okay, a bunch of highs. Cross. Yeah, don't cross your legs. When I was pregnant, was working out and it actually helped pelvic girdle pain. So that's why you hear, there are studies that say people who enter pregnancy in really good physical health tend to have not better pregnancies, but not as many of the aches and pains and might have, may have, there is some evidence that they might have an easier birth because their core is in shape. Now there's going to be some changes in the core because of a big belly, but that, it, you know, it helps us enter pregnancy with a strong core and a strong lower back. Okay. And just musculoskeletally in general. So there is something to be said for that. So if you're listening and you have the time before you get pregnant to get that all in check, put that on your list of things to do before you start trying to conceive. Get your core in shape, get your lower back in shape, get your body in shape. Let's see. I was told to never use a heating pad while pregnant. I'm not going to say that to anybody. Heating pad you can put on your back, but you have to be don't fall asleep with a heating pad. You know, don't put anything directly on your belly. You can use warm compresses for short periods of time, especially if it's on the rod leg make pain. But, you know, the whole heating pad thing, because heating pads can be turned on. And I've fallen asleep with a heating pad on before. I wasn't pregnant and I regretted it. <laughs> okay. Because people tend to, can do that. You don't want to do it in pregnancy. Okay. So it's, it's not necessarily a never thing. Depends on how you're using warmth to help with your, you know, aches and pains. And I would never put anything directly on your uterus or where your belly is in general. Okay. I'm having terrible varicose veins in my pelvic area. Is that normal? Um, it's terrible. No, it's not normal. Having vulvar varicosities in pregnancy is rare, especially when they get to the point where they're very painful and big and they can even bleed. 
there's not, once it gets to that point, there's not a whole lot we can do until you deliver, unfortunately. And make sure you talk to somebody, you let your obstetrician know, try a pregnancy support belt because that can help take some pressure off your pelvis. Um, but um, once it gets that bad, I'm, I'm sorry, it, there's not a whole lot you can do until you deliver other than doing some conservative measures just to try to help your discomfort a little bit. I've had numbness on my right leg, sharp from hip to my ankle and sharp pain with this. It could be sciatica pain. Yeah, it could. Lots of people who are doing. So what's happening if your ankles start to swell after giving birth? Okay. When you are pregnant, your blood volume increases by 50 to 60% to supply all the areas of your body, your breast, your uterus, everything that's helping to make a baby. Then you deliver and all that blood volume has to go somewhere. You will lose some of it with the delivery. Okay, there's an expected amount of blood loss with delivery, um, but you're not gonna lose all of that that you gained. So it's gotta go somewhere. So what does it do? It kind of, what we call third spaces. And it'll go out into the tissue for a period of time and then until your body kicks in and it pulls it back in and you pee it out. It pulls back into the vasculature and you pee it out. That's different for everybody. I have patients who never swelled I have patients who swelled before they got pregnant. I have patients who started swelling in the second trimester. That tends to happen earlier with, subsequent, with each subsequent pregnancy, okay? So everything's different. As long as the swelling after your delivery is equal in both legs and ankles, as long as it's not painful, if you're, fi if you're finding it's painful or unequal, then you need to be seen because that could be an indication of a blood clot because some people do develop blood clots after they deliver. And the, you know, you're still at a hypercoagulable state where, you know, pregnancy people who are pregnant are predisposed to uh, uh, clotting and the same is true for a certain period of time postpartum. Okay. Thanks for answering questions. I don't know what they're saying. So I understand sleep on the left side is so it's, it's not about sleeping on your left side. So I actually was going to do a video about this. I'm on TikTok also as TikTok baby dog. And I do a lot of educational videos there and that, I, that I share on my babies after 35 on Instagram. It's called a leftward tilt. When you're laying, as you get out of the first trimester and into the second trimester, there is the vessel, the IVC that blank brings blood from your, your, your body back up to your heart to oxygenate and then be pumped out to the body again. It's a big vessel. It's the aorta and the vena cava that course up behind the uterus, okay? The vena cava is what's bringing the body from the peripheral tissue in your body up back up into the lungs to be oxygenated again and then pumped back out. As your uterus gets bigger, it puts pressure on the IBC. So if you're laying completely flat and your uterus is pressuring that IBC, it's not allowing that blood flow to get back up the way it should and it can cause you to be dizzy or it could potentially, in worst case scenarios, de de decrease the blood flow to the uterus. So that's why you hear, you know, I shouldn't lay flat. What you can do is what's called a leftward tilt to where you're just kind of tilted over to your left side rather than laying flat. I did that a lot when I used my pregnancy pillow, especially as I got further along and I had twins, I kind of slept like this. You don't, it's not like you have to sleep like this. You just have to ha be it tilted to help that uterus kind of tilt over a little bit to the leftward side so it takes pressure off that vessel, the, the IVC or the vena cava, sorry, the vena cava. That's what we're talking about. And I'm getting ready to, to do a video on that soon. Okay, I think that's it. I have like seven more minutes. I appreciate your time. I hope you guys learned something from this. Again, I'll get with Belly Bandit and I will send those resources to you guys. And um, I'll put some kind of um, blog together and share it with Belly Bandit so you guys can get this information. I hope you enjoyed your time. I enjoyed mine. And I hope that I was able to teach you guys a few things. Have a great day. Follow me on Babies After 35 on Instagram. I'm also on TikTok at TikTok Baby Doc. Um, those are the two main places I am. I share a lot of information. I'm also very big on sharing COVID information. So if you need COVID information, I have, which I'm going to add here, I'm going to plug because we, not just because I'm plugging me, but we need to know about COVID. I have information on COVID uh, vaccinations in pregnancy and lactation, COVID and fertility, COVID infection, and COVID studies meaning studies that you can get uh, enroll in if you had COVID while pregnant or lactating or you're getting the vaccination while pregnant or lactating, there are studies you can enroll in. Um, that's it. You guys have a great day and I'll be back with you soon.